Hello everyone, welcome to ELE 3302. Therefore, uh, my name is Chao. I'm a, a senior research fellow at uh, the next generation wireless research group. Um, so my main responsibility as a university is uh, research. Um, I've been teaching this uh, course for three years since uh, COVID. I've really enjoyed uh, teaching this course and uh, uh, teaching has benefited my research. Uh, I will tell you more as we go. Um, so this course will be about wireless and optical communications. Uh, there are some references, uh, reading materials uh, here that are mostly uh, books written by researchers from a group. Um, so you can, you can get them from the library, but uh, the most important thing is the lecture notes, the, the slides. So everything we want you to uh, know, everything we want you to understand from uh, lecture notes, um, they are not, they are quite abstract. Um, it's really important to to familiar yourself with uh, all these concepts. And if you read them through um, multiple times, <clears throat> it doesn't take a long time to read them. Um, so there are three parts uh, for this uh, course. The first part is uh, so, uh, channel modeling and modulation part of wireless communication, which are the fundamentals of wireless communications. Um, so I'll be teaching this part. <clears throat> the second part is uh, uh, the waveform, which is CDMA or uh, OFDM. Uh, this part will be taught by Lie Liang, uh, Professor Li Liang Yang. The third part is optical communication. So this course was uh, firstly designed about 20 years ago, and it was designed by Professor Lars Hansel uh, when he was a lecturer. And, uh, and then it was handed over to uh, Professor uh, Rob Munder when he was a lecturer. And then it was handed over to uh, Professor Li Liangyang, who is still in charge of one third of, uh, of, uh, of the course. And then it was handed, handed, handed over to me. Um, all, all of my, <clears throat> all of these people who have taught this course um, have become professors. So I hope that's also the case for me. But uh, <clears throat> the important thing is I really want this to be a positive uh, experience for all of us. Um, so uh, it's kind of funny that because it has been changed hands um, multiple times, Many people put a lot of ideas into the first part when they first get on the, the, the teaching part of, of uh, the, the first part of uh, teaching. Um, so I have to say that the first part um, is probably the most difficult part uh, with a lot of information. And the first coursework, co sorry, the first coursework is probably the most difficult one. Um, um, but, uh, my my purpose uh, in this course are very clear. So first of all, I want to to have learned something. I want you to feel that this wireless communication subject is interesting, and you have learned something. And uh, maybe after many years, graduating um, from here, you probably wouldn't remember Doppler effect, but you still remember some methodologies uh, and some some concepts of uh, wireless communication. And certainly I want to make uh, your revisions easier for you. And I, I, want, uh, I want your uh, exam results to reflect the effort you put in. So it's also another funny story why, why um, take over the first part of this course. It was in COVID and we uh, prepared for exam questions um, very early on. And then there's this a lockdown and students wouldn't be able to come back for uh, sitting uh, their exams uh, in here in Southampton. So it became an open book exam. And then I, uh, I said to, to Lie Liang, uh, who's a professor now, I, I said to him that, uh, what are we going to do? The exam questions are probably too easy for the students to uh, do uh, open book because it was uh, it was turning it's open book exam means uh, you can 
uh, do it in front of your computer for 20, uh, it's open for 24 hours. You can finish it anytime you want to within 24 hours. And uh, you can uh, you can look at your lecture notes, you can search online. Um, so I said to, to Lilian that uh, these are probably, uh, the questions are probably too easy for them because when we designed the questions, they are not for um, open book exams. Uh, Lilian said to me that when he was in charge of the, the teaching of the whole uh, course, he asked his students to mark uh, their own performance and uh, it takes 10% uh, of the fi final results. And most students are very genuine and very honest about their performance. And uh, the marks they give uh, for themselves are uh, similar to the result, results that they did uh, in the exams. Um, so we, we were hopeful that uh, the exam results would be kind of um, a correct reflection of uh, how, how we taught you and how students um, uh, uh, how students understand all these uh, questions. But actually in that year, um, the students did really well in their exams, except for a few who uh, uh, feel really depressed during uh, COVID and dropped out, uh, drop off. Uh, so they didn't finish uh, the exam. But otherwise, most students uh, get really high, high marks. Uh, there's also something we want to avoid because uh, it doesn't really reflect on how how much you, you get from you take away from the course it doesn't fully reflect on your effort um so so one thing i'm going to do differently this year is that as i mentioned in the email i sent to you last night uh that i will give you a question to uh consider uh i will give you a feedback uh paper for you to take away uh, at the end of uh, each lecture. And then uh, I would really appreciate it if you could take like five to 10 minutes to think about those questions. And when you come back, you uh, write down your, your answers, uh, even just some keywords. If you only have five or 10 minutes, just write down some keywords that you remember that are related to the question that are, that are asked. If I have more time, please elaborate on those. Uh, um, keywords. And then these, uh, they, all of these questions, they are from past exam papers. Um, so I hope during this uh, uh, feedback process, uh, it can help you to have a general idea of how difficult uh, or how easy the exam is for you and what we really want to learn. And also, it gave me some feedback of uh, how, how well you understand me. Um, so I hope this can keep, keep you uh, coming to my lectures. Um, so I recorded this session before uh, the actual lecture as a practice. Um, um, but in-person teaching is always better because I, I, di I did start in COVID and the teaching was online. It wasn't very... Um, uh, it wasn't as good as in-person teaching. Uh, and the second thing I'm going to try, so the first thing is, uh, uh, the, the first purpose is to make exams uh, strip, uh, really uh, as reflection of how, how much effort you put in. And uh, another thing uh, I'm going to do, try this year is, uh, I will also uh, tell you um, examples from my research work that are uh, related to this uh, course as we as we go, um, and I hope that could give you perspective of how uh, how w w how how this all of these knowledges uh, are related to practical issues and how they can uh, make an impact uh, in the world. Because as we uh, dig uh, further there will be a lot of equations and a lot of uh, physics concepts. They are very abstract and they are, um, uh, they, it can feel like they are a bit out of touch uh, to the real world at times, but they are all fundamentals of what we are using today uh, in terms of technologies, wireless communication technologies. And the third thing I want to try is uh, a little bit more relaxing. So 
uh, from last year, I try I started to try to collect some jokes and then tell them in class and try to relate those jokes to the knowledge uh, that I teach in class. Um, so the students normally respond well. Uh, they seem to enjoy uh, the jokes and uh, stay awake. Um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, keep doing that. Last year, actually, um, I showed a Mimi uh, in class and then I turned the Mimi into an exam question. So I, what I try to do is I really want to link everything together and then make it as interesting as possible. Um, I can only try my best, so um, bear with me. So the second part will be taught by Professor Li Liangyang. The third part is optical communication, which was uh, um, in the past it was taught by normally a lecturer from ORC, uh, but last year it was taught by uh, Dr. Ke uh, Li. But last year he uh, left the university, and then just two weeks ago the university has realized that they didn't find uh, another person to teach this part. So I will be teaching you the third part, optical communication as well, but it's not really my area of expertise. Um, uh, but as I as I said before, I I have very clear purposes in my part of teaching. Um, so a lot of uh, materials in the slides uh, they are edited by different people. I will show them to you, but not not all of them are very. Uh, are covered by exams, and not all of them are very appealing to me. So I wouldn't throw them to you as well, because I wouldn't be able to uh, uh, teach them as well as how, uh, uh, compared to other things I'm very passionate about, and I really want to tell you about. Um, so so yeah, it's, I hope you uh, keep coming to the lectures and keep give me, giving me f feedbacks. Okay, uh, so this, uh, this slide is, um, I've shown this uh, page of slides to uh, a variety of different people in different occasions. So I really want to uh, tell you, this is the first thing I really want to tell you about, which is uh, the wireless evolution history uh, from 1G to 3G. So we are in the era of 5G now. I came a long, long way since the 80s. The whole, um, so normally uh, one generation uh, will happen in every 10 to 15 years and then research is about 10 to 15 years ahead. So in terms of research, we're doing subjects that, that are uh, going to make a difference in, in the era of 6G. Um, but, uh, uh, but we need to know what's happened in the past and what is still lacking. So most of you um, are too young to remember probably the first three, sorry, first three generations. The so first generation happened in the uh, 1980s. So it was uh, <clears throat> actually the, the whole field of wireless communication started in the 1950s, but the commercial application of wireless communication started in 1980s, where general public used um, uh, wireless networks. So the first generation is uh, basically analog a communication system processing analog signal. It was very expensive, um, and the size of the mobile phone is really bunky, it's huge in size. So if anyone's uh, father or grandparents, uh, sorry, uh, <clears throat> if anyone's parents or grandparents uh, did use a uh, mobile phone in, in the 80s, uh, that was probably a privilege because it was very expensive at that time. And then the second generation was a very successful generation. A lot of things that happened in the second generation are still meaningful today for uh, for 5G and the future generations. Is uh, that all the signals are digitalized. So we started to process, uh, we started to heavily rely on digital signal processing and digital circuits. Uh, 
one key feature is error correction code. Can I ask you, uh, by showing hands, how many of you have uh, uh, have worked with error correction code in your previous courseworks, or have you have you studied error correction code? So basically, if you if you want to transmit a string of binary bits, um, by wireless uh, channels, the wireless environment is highly hostile. It will corrupt your signal transmission. So what we normally do is we add redundancies. So we we add some um, uh, extra bits at the end of signal transmission, and then impose correlation among all these bits. And then as a receiver, if you have an error happened in the middle, by observing the correlation between bits, we'll be able to correct an error because we know that there are a limited number of code words. And if an error happens in the middle, the signal you received is not in the code word book sample. That's a simplified explanation of uh, error correction code. Um, error correction code is really key to a wireless uh, communication. So every, gen every uh, huge development, uh, every like, new era of uh, wireless communication is marked by uh, advances in error correction code. So error correction code is a uh, like really key issue here. Another thing that's very successful in the era of 2G is uh, standardization. So in the era of the first generation, 1G, uh, when you have a mobile phone in one country, you wouldn't be able to travel to other country with your mobile phone because uh, the different country different standards. But uh, since uh, since the second generation, so the old organizations around the world that have an uh, um, annual uh, meeting conference to uh, standardize the format for signal uh, transmission and the spectrum allocation. So that, that kind of uh, cooperation is really, really meaningful and constructive. And it is still in place today for uh, standard, standardizing uh, wireless communication technologies. And then because 2G was really, really successful at the beginning of 3G, all the operators are really, really excited about the new technologies. And uh, many operators, uh, they pay a lot of money to the government to buy light spectrum. Um, but uh, actually, at that time, the market is not ready. Um, many customers, most of the customers were happy with uh, uh, 2G service with uh, phone calls and texting. Um, and uh, so many operators actually, uh, of 3G, many operators lost a lot of money and they have to uh, give the license back to the government without a refund. So it was a little bit uh, doomed at the beginning of 3G. But there is one element, one factor that actually saved 3G and also motivated the following generations. Can anyone guess what is the uh, element, uh, what is uh, uh, the, the exciting thing that actually saved 3G? So it's actually on the slides, it's uh, smartphones. So in the era of uh, 3G, uh, in the middle of uh, early 2000s, people start to queue overnight outside Apple stores to buy uh, iPhones. So uh, mobile phone become no longer only a mobile terminal for um, phone calls and uh, texting. It's also an entertainment unit um, for internet access. So that's, uh, that was a really ex exciting uh, change and that kind of moved 3G. So, so then 4G become um, a remarkably successful generation where we, we start to use, it's, 4G is more technolo technology driven and then the market is also ready because of the internet access by mobile phone start to use OFDM, which is a uh, <clears throat> modulation that uh, Liliang will uh, teach you later on in the course, um, which can very, uh, which can better mitigate the fading effect in wireless uh, communications. 
And we also start to use MIMO, which is multiple input, multiple output. So we use multiple antennas to support uh, wireless communication. So all of these technologies are very, very uh, successful. They, uh, they draw up um, the evolution uh, from, from 4G. And then now we're in the era of 5G. On the left, left hand side, we see a spectrum allocation in 4G, which is a top one figure. And then we see bottom two, we have frequency range. Sorry, I probably can't have. So this one here is a 4G spectrum. And this is frequency range one for 5G. This is frequency two for 5G. So by looking at uh, this figure, can anyone tell me uh, what is the biggest difference between 4G and 5G? So yeah, 5G has uh, more spectrum, more bandwidth. Um, so is it suspicious to you? I'm sure uh, most of you have heard of the conspiracy that 5G can be harmful to human health. So can you, so, 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 I, I, so today's, in today's lecture, I want you to, to be able to, um, to tell them why 5G is not harmful to human health. But in order to make that influence, we need to listen first. We need to think uh, why people might think 5G is harmful to a body. Any ideas why uh, pe uh, uh, people might think 5G is suspicious, it can harm a body? So as, you said, uh, as we mentioned before, this one is we have more bandwidth. We didn't use that before. Why we are using them now? And secondly, we probably see more base stations and more antennas. Why are they there? Why do we need more? Do they generate more signals and uh, more signal powers that would harm our body, uh, harm, harm our health? So concerns are very legitimate. We need to uh, acknowledge that uh, all these concerns are uh, legitimate, and we did take them into account. We develop wireless communication system. What is spectrum? Spectrum is natural resource. It's limited natural resource. We're only utilizing a uh, natural uh, resource here. So, so so all the signals in, in nature, including the voice signal that you can hear and the visible light signal that you can see, they all have a frequency domain representation so mathematical representation, unique representation in the frequency domain. And the collection of frequencies is called a spectrum. How much frequency is available in different, uh, in different range. So basically, a uh, voice signal would be lower than the URF here, lower value URF. And visible light would be higher uh, at higher frequency band compared to uh, a millimeter wave, which, which we are using in 5G. So basically, we use the spectrum between voice signal and visible light signal so that wireless communication do not interfere with our everyday life. But more importantly, this, all these uh, frequency bands the spectrum between visible light and uh, voice signal. They share the characteristic as uh, visible light, similar characteristic as uh, uh, visible light. So the umbrella um, argument for arguing that a very doesn't uh, harm health is that there is a effect called ionizing radiation, which happens in the spectrum above visible light. So higher than, so in ionizing, when ionizing radiation happens, uh, it can remove uh, electrons from atoms. So it would physically change things. So it's really physical, physically harm our body. We still use signals for specialized uh, purposes, such as X-ray, because they can it 
or body and see what's going on inside our body. But we do not use them in wireless communication. So all the all the uh, all the spectrum between uh, voice signal that we can hear and visible light signal that we can see, they do not have ionizing radiation. They wouldn't change physically change anything. So the we, we normally use in 4G and we still use in 5G. It's conventionally used in, in 4G. It's called microwave band. So microwave band is not only used for communication. It's also used in your uh, household device, microwave that heat or food. So the signal doesn't physically change your food, but signal power can be absorbed by water element food so like it heat your food so we do need to be about the, the power is uh, but how do we know the power is too high because water can absorb the power if the power is too high we we, we, we will feel it it's like if uh, if post in sunshine for strong sunshine for really long or skin can feel it because water elements in our skin can feel that the power is too strong. But our regulation on wireless communication is far from that that we our body can, can feel. Even if there is no purpose of wireless communication, these frequency bands, these spectrums, they exist, physical exists in nature. We are only using them um, for wireless communication. Uh, they always exist. And so why we didn't use millimeter wave uh, band before? So that's that's a really important question. So physics detects that uh, um, so physics detects that uh, um, uh, as the frequency increases, the antenna size would become smaller. So this means that in millimeter wave, the antenna size is smaller. It was more difficult to manufacture like 10 to 20 years ago and also we see more antennas now because as the antenna size uh, decreases the radiation power would also decrease but the total radiation power is a total is determined by the total area of all the antennas combined so in millimeter wave it's true that we use more antennas but the total area of uh, all the antennas combined should be the same. We regulate it the same way as we, how we regulate all the signal that we used before. We use wireless signal not only for uh, uh, cellular networks, uh, your mobile phones, we also use it for radar. We also use it for communicating to airplanes and satellites. And those signals exist in nature as well. It's, all the way since Big Bang, um, all those signals were generated by Big Bang and they kind of wander around in the universe. So we we only mimic a generation of wireless uh, signal and use those uh, spectrum and regulate the power uh, in the same way as uh, as how it's um, not, not going to be uh, filled by our body, not going to be harmful to our body. Um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's why, that's, that's, that's why 5G is not really, uh, harmful to, uh, human health. So as, as I said before, research normally goes about 10 to 15 years ahead of research. So right now we are doing research into 6G. So what will 6G, uh, look like? So I have recently uh, helped my research group to get uh, uh, funding that's worth uh, 1 million pounds, and it's about 6G. Uh, but actually before industry accepts uh, like universal 6G standard, no one actually knows for sure what 6G will look like. But we do know that there are some uh, very important research areas that are really popular uh, right now they are going to make an impact uh, in 10 to 15 years. So before we 
talk about six G, we need to be aware of what is lacking in five G, what is the problem with five G, and how we can improve from there. Any guesses? What is um, what, what should be improved from five G based on your experience, maybe? Um, uh, so what what is uh, what should what should be improved from five uh, G? Um, so as I mentioned before, we have more uh, base stations and more antennas. Um, it does uh, raise concerns, and especially in the light of net zero carbon emission, UK has committed a huge uh, amount about uh, achieving carbon neutral neutrality. So we do need to reduce the power for generating uh, wireless signals. Uh, and supporting wireless networks, uh, it takes about one to two percent of the uh, all the power consumed uh, in national grid. Um, so that's one thing to consider. A bigger picture here is that uh, up to uh, twenty twenty two, so last year, about over eighty percent of the world population, so everyone in the world, uh, about. 80% uh, of the population has been covered by 4G service, but only 60% have internet access. So this is really worrying because this is an equality issue because for about 20% of the people of the whole world population, they are covered by 4G coverage, but they cannot use it because they uh, do, do not have the economic uh, means to uh, to afford it, but internet can bring bring about a lot of uh, 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 important uh, wealth creation, a, a lot of knowledge. Um, so it's really important to make a wireless access, internet access at least, accessible to everyone and everywhere. You know, everyone and everything everywhere. Uh, the current 5G can only cover about 20% of the land and 5% of the ocean. It wasn't uh, of, it was partly because that cover all the other part of the, of the planet uh, is not that uh, commercially beneficial because there are not a lot of people living in there. Um, but, uh, but uh, but in the future, if we if we uncover those areas, we can bring about more uh, uh, commercial benefits, such as it can help in uh, fishing, shipping, uh, remote agriculture. We can monitor and uh, control activities in remote areas, and then this can motivate operators to provide coverage to people living in remote remote areas and uh, developing countries. Because they can bring bring back more uh, economic benefits for them as well, um, so that's that's an important thing that we want to improve from five G. It didn't really solved by any of the previous generations. So one way to solve it is uh, to integrate networks for satellites and airplanes and vehicles on the ground, because satellites they have they are really high up. Uh, in the in the space, they can see a large area uh, of the ground. So wireless communication is share some similarity to uh, visible light. So the, we also want uh, more long sight. So satellite uh, obviously can provide us with a lot of long sight coverage to a lot of areas. It can cover the whole planet. But there are also different uh, considerations. For example, satellites are very far away. So uh, when we rely on satellite communication, um, uh, the, the delay would be higher than the terrestrial uh, communication. And also uh, the low Earth orbit satellites, they travel very far, fast. They are normally traveling at uh, Mach 20 to Mach 30, which, we, which means 20 to 30 times of uh, speed of sound. So it's really challenging to support uh, coverage to them. So in the past, we, we still provide wireless communication 
uh, channel to uh, satellites and airplanes, but uh, those communication uh, techniques are mostly for control purposes um, to uh, control the, where, where the satellites should uh, fly, should uh, elevate, and where the airplanes should, uh, should fly to, so that we, uh, we have a better safety. Um, but in the future, we will uh, we'll try to um, uh, make more spectrum available to them so that they can provide more coverage to people on the ground, um, everyone on the ground. Uh, another new issue is uh, integration of radar and communication. So radar has a history of over 100 years. And com wireless communication has a history of, uh, it's, it's starting from the 50, 1950s. But two areas, they, uh, they have been developed separately over the history. And they, uh, they use the same spectrum. They use the same uh, signal propagation uh, characteristic. They share the same characteristics. So they kind of they have to compete for spectrum. But as I said before, spectrum is really valuable and a limited uh, natural resource. So the future generation, it, it is innovation, or it, it is or, uh, also or, or vision that we want to integrate radar and communication. It can save lives. For example, the, uh, it, it's not really realistic to have like CCTV camera for 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 all for for uh, for 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 everyone's home, it will be very costly and it will raise a lot of privacy issues. But uh, visible light, for example, and also wireless communication, they are everywhere. So, for example, if a transmitter transmits signal to a receiver, the receiver gets uh, the information carried by that wireless signal, and the wireless signal is like visible light. So it can be reflected back to the transmitter. So the transmitter can, for based on the signal that bounces back to the transmitter, the transmitter can estimate the distance uh, of the receiver from the transmitter. It can estimate the distance. It can also estimate the velocity. So it can, it can have an idea of, um, uh, of the statistic of uh, of the situation, it kind of make the integration of radar and communication will make your Wi-Fi signals or your mobile signals to be able to see things. So why it can save lives? For example, if there is like massive shooting or if there is any irregular safety uh, issues, there will be irregular irregularities in uh, human activities. And then it can trigger a warning if the wireless signal can see pattern. And also, for example, uh, for, for an elderly person at home, if uh, he or she fell, fell on the ground, the wireless signal can also detect that. It can save lives. But I can also see that uh, uh, at the same time, conspiracies is uh, looming because we, we 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 really care about our privacy. Is we don't want, for example, government to 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 be able to see everything through wireless communication. So, um, so basically, a lot of first of all, a lot of personal information is already uh, accessible by internet. It's really important that we regulate the right uh, for for privacy. Another thing is in communications, we also have a lot of techniques to improve uh, privacy. For example, if there is a transmitter, uh, let me draw something here. For, the, for example, if there is a transmitter here, there is a receiver here, and there is a if dropper here. The transmitter want to transmit signal to here. Wireless communication can try to uh, improve the receive signal power here and at the same time try to minimize the signal power in here so that is uh, a way to improve privacy i will talk more about this as we go uh, deeper into the course another interesting trend would be machine learning uh, so uh various computation so machine learning has been remarkably successful in computer science um 
but wireless communication is very different from computer science because first of all, wireless communication, wireless computing resource is highly scarce. It's not comparable to uh, com computer labs. And secondly, it's a wireless environment is highly dynamic in nature. So we have a lot of cars, humans moving around. We have a lot of uh, changes in environment. They all change the so wireless propagation environment uh, instantaneously all the time. So conventionally, the wireless, uh, the whole field of wireless communication uh, is uh, is built upon um, a mo it's model based driven. So uh, 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 machine learning is data driven. You don't really care about the underlying model. You collect data, you establish relationship between input and output, and then try to make better decisions or produce better data from uh, your input data. And then what is communication? We normally need to um, understand what's happening in the, in the channel. We need to build a mathematical model and then try to offer engineering solution to the uh, to the uh, to, to the to those equations. So wireless communication is highly uh, model driven. Um, but uh, there are also a few things machine learning can help. For example, uh, as I mentioned before, OFDM here is uh, designed to mitigate uh, the fading effect. Uh, in wireless communication channels. Um, so the major drawback of OFDM is that it would increase the peak to average power ratio. So it would uh, consume a lot of power for uh, as a power amplifier. So machine learning can help here because machine learning can um, can um, can train a, a signal that is optimized to both end-to-end -end performance and also at the same time reduce uh, uh, peak to average power ratio. So that, that is something machine learning can help. Um, it can complement uh, uh, model-based solutions. It can solve solutions that can no longer be solved by, by model, uh, by mathematical models uh, in wireless communications. Um, but anyway, I, I think I digressed a little bit. I hope you, you find this field is exciting and making a difference and uh, also interesting. Maybe some of you, some, some of you will work in this uh, field and uh, work with us as well if you want to do a PhD uh, or study a master's after this. Um, I forgot to mention earlier that I, I do have some tips for uh, for you to uh, to study well um, on this course. Although I, I'm sure most of you are capable of uh, doing it well anyway. So as I said, all the slides uh, they are not they, they do not contain a lot of uh, words. There are a lot of figures and equations. Um, so it's it's not really uh, very time consuming to read them. Uh, don't feel the burden or anxiety from reading reading them. So do read them multiple times before and after lectures. For each lecture, I can only cover about twenty pages, so you can kind of have a glance before um, before I start and see the scope of uh, the thing I'm going to cover. Second thing is relationship between figures, equations, and definitions. I'm sure if um, have you, any of you have watched an um, American sitcom called Big Bang Theory. Um, I really enjoy watching that. It's really entertaining um, portrayal of how scientists work um, and their lives. Uh, so Sheldon give uh, Howard such a difficult time because uh, Howard is engineer, but and uh, Sheldon is like a physicist. So in science world, uh, sometimes people think physicists physicists are more important than engineers, but regardless of uh, what he said, engineer is real science. We need to understand the physics. Uh, physical 
uh, phenomenon. So we need to understand the physical characteristics. And then we need to formulate the equations that, uh, that to reflect uh, the open problems in physics. And then we need to provide solutions to those equations. Um, so it's really important to, to learn this uh, methodology and make everything logical to you. So that, uh, um, so for example, when I was in high school, my physics teacher used to say that if you want to learn physics well, you need to be able to, for example, when you are given a piece of uh, blank paper, you should be able to draw a figure that il illustrate uh, the physical uh, phenomenon. And then you, you, uh, you should be able to uh, uh, derive all the equations step by step without looking at your textbook. Um, so, so you, so, so we have all these slides. We have all these slides that have a lot of words for the definitions. Um, you wouldn't be able to memorize all the words as the exams. But if, for example, if there is an exam question, and if you first, first of all, draw a figure that. Uh, uh, reflect your understanding and then and then elaborate your understanding based on the figure, then it would be really helpful. It would be helpful for you to prepare for exams and it would be helpful for you to uh, kind of uh, still remember uh, some of the physical concepts we learned from this class many years afterwards. So make sure everything is logical to you. And after class, access is the same. So also, uh, all the feedback paper I give you after the after each lecture, they all have one question. Sometimes you can uh, draw a figure or give me some uh, 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 key words that are related to the question that I ask you. Um, so it's a really good pra practice. I know many of you are very uh, environmental aware. Um, you probably don't want uh, to write a lot of things on papers anymore. Um, but this old way really help you to memorize things and understand things. Um, but if you are really against uh, using physical papers, you can alternatively, you can send me an uh, email uh, for, the, for all the feedbacks. I would really appreciate it if you uh, work with me and uh, uh, finish the feedback questions. Um, but it's, it's not, uh, strictly speaking, it's not compulsory. It's not, it, it won't be counted into your exam uh, final uh, final marks. Um, but uh, it does reflect on the effort you put in. So yeah, keep thinking, keep asking, keep uh, uh, questions, keep reading. I almost forgot I prepared two talks here. Um, that, uh, that, that, that have, uh, that, that have little, a little relationship with, uh, what we have learned from this page. Um, so the first, anyway, the first joke is, uh, this don't trust atoms. Why? Because they make up everything. So can anyone tell me how, uh, what concept is it related to? It is related to a concept that I explained to you earlier. So it kind of uh, related to uh, the effect of ionizing radiation where electrons can be removed from atoms. So you cannot trust uh, the signal in that spectrum anymore. They would harm uh, human health. Um, but so early signal use uh, various communication signal, they use uh, spectrum uh, below visible light above uh, the sound signal. So they do not have the effect of ionizing radiation. You can always trust that wireless communication signals do not uh, harm your body, they do not make your body radioactive, they do not physically change anything. But they, uh, we do need to regulate their power so that uh, the water elements in your body or in the environment wouldn't absorb um, heat and then uh, make us feel uncomfortable. Okay, second joke. 
Um, so uh, in, the, in the past, students seem to like this stroke, but it's not 100% uh, classroom appropriate. Um, but it's a really good drug. Anyway, so don't fart in an Apple store. Why? Because they don't have Windows. They don't have Microsoft Windows. So this this kind of related to uh, what I told you about the era of 3G, where people start to queue outside Apple store overnight for iPhones without farting, hopefully. But uh, um, but that um, but that time, it's, but iPhone was uh, a smartphone was a really important uh, invention in the field of wireless communication. It kind of saved 3G, saved my job, and saved. Uh, all the knowledge that we are learning today uh, makes them still relevant and makes them uh, able to uh, improve people's life. Okay, uh, so there are, there are some more keywords here. Uh, we are going to, I have mentioned some of them. Uh, we are going to learn um, more of them uh, later on uh, as we dig deeper into the course. So the first technology that I'm going to teach you today uh, is uh, multiple assess techniques. So as I said before, the spectrum resource is natural resource. We only have limited natural resource, but we have unlimited uh, data demand. Whenever there is new application, there is new data. So there's no limit in the growth of uh, data demand. So how can we differentiate different users to use uh, the same resource at the same time? How can we support different users? So this is a good example that uh, is a very simple figure that you can draw uh, by yourself on a piece of paper, and it would help you to uh, remember and understand this concept. So wireless signal in general, it has three domains, frequency domain, time domain, and the power domain. So frequency domain, uh, time domain, and power domain. So the first uh, technique is called FDMA, which is frequency division multiple assess, which means we differentiate different users by, by letting them using different channels, they are separated in the spectrum, they use different frequencies, so they do not interfere with each other. It is, it is like if we, a lot of people want to talk to each other at the same time, we can use different rooms so that we do not interfere with each other, we are separated completely. And then the second uh, method is TDMA, which is uh, time division multiple assess. This means uh, different users are scheduled to talk in turn so, so that they, they do not uh, interfere, they, they, they do not conflict, uh, they do not interfere with each other, but they use the same spectrum. So they share the same frequency, but they, uh, they are differentiated in time domain. So we are all in the same room. When one person is talking, all the others stay quiet so that we, uh, we can have effective communication. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to all communicate in the same room uh, at the same time. The third method is called CDMA, code division multiple assess. So this is um, to draw an analogy this is like we're all in the same room and we all want to talk at the same time, but we can speak different languages. So two people speak English uh, in one corner, two people speak, for example, Chinese in another corner, because the way we speak, the power of our voice signal would vary in a different pattern um, in different languages. So two communication exists at the same time in the same room but we still be able to uh, communicate at the same time. So in various communication, what we normally do is we modulate the signal onto a code word. So the code word would uh, specify the pattern of signal, tra signal uh, power variation. 
So one pair of user have one code, another pair of user have another code. They vary differently in power. So they can differentiate in power domain. So code division, uh, division multiple size. So fourth uh, method is base division multiple size. So for example, if you have a base station here in the middle, you know that signals from different users, they come from different directions. Then base station can still differentiate them. It's like people shouting at you from different direction. You can still know who they are um, up to a limit. So there are always limits here. So it, when you try to detect signal from one direction, all the other signals become noise. So if noise is too high, you wouldn't be able to listen to this desired user. For CDMA as well, so uh, you, you can differentiate different users by different codes, but there are only limited number of orthogonal codes, which are completely orthogonal to each other. So for example, if two people both speak in English, but in different accents, there are really high correlation between two, uh, two code words. So they will still interfere with each other, right? Um, so multiple size for figures. It would be really helpful if you can draw that figure, uh, those four figures, and also elaborate on how can we support uh, different users in different ways. So this is how we normally plan for um, sales. Uh, coverage for different mobile users. For example, we, as I said before, spectrum is limited. Uh, so all the cells associated with number two, they're all dark, dark colored uh, cells. Um, so we should be able to reuse this spectrum. But when we design uh, mobile cells, what we normally do is we try to make so cells associated with the same number, so associated with number two as far away as possible. So all the cells associated with the same number, for example, number one, they use the same spectrum, but they are separated as far away as possible. In 5G and, and future generations, we are working on a based uh, kind of use cellless communication, which is user-centric, where the user can decide which base station is nearby and can serve it. Um, so that way we do not have self-structure like this anymore. But this is only like a, like a background knowledge. It's not a very important um, technology that we, we want you to learn. And here is like a, also another conceptual thing uh, about how coverage can serve us. So we normally want base stations to be placed as high up as possible. We often place them uh, at the building top or a hill top because wireless communication is similar to visible light. We want line of sight as strong as possible. So macro cell is normally provided by base station placed at uh, the building top or hill top that can provide a large coverage. But in city areas, there are a lot of buildings, a lot of trees, a lot of cars, they all cause blockage. So what we normally do is we also place uh, base stations on the roadside um, and at sm small building top as well to provide smaller coverage, uh, which are called micro cells. And then indoor environment is even more hostile because we have a lot of walls, we have a lot of objects uh, in the room. They all cause reflection of the signal. Reflections are not uh, very, uh, it's not a very good thing in wireless communication because what we normally re receive is, uh, uh, we, we, if we receive a lot of re reflections, they kind of um, smear or vision. Um, so uh, physically speaking, we receive a lot of replica of the same signal. They are um, it is together sometimes constructively, sometimes destructively. We don't normally have control over this. 
So what we normally do is we want to improve the coverage indoor. We sometimes place a set point or rotor uh, indoor to provide coverage, which is uh, pico cell coverage, which are normally like very small coverage. Okay, um, so feedback today. So the question uh, that uh, on this piece of paper that I'm going to give you, uh, give it to you today is what are the key features of 5G and why is 5G not harmful to human health? Um, so if you only have like five or 10 minutes before or even you come back to my lecture next time and you, you, didn't, you didn't really answer these questions, you can only take like five minutes um, to write down some keywords that you still remember. For example, ionizing, ionizing radiation, which is uh, the biggest thing uh, to explain why 5G is not harmful to our body. And then if you have more time, you can elaborate on it. And you can also reflect on why do people think uh, it is harm, uh, some people think it might be harmful and why it is not based on what you have learned. And also, if you have any jokes or memes related to IT, double E, or wireless communication, you can send, send them to me. Uh, you, can, you can leave them on this uh, feedback uh, paper and then hand it to me next time. Or you can send me an email. Um, uh, it's uh, important um, to keep you awake. Um, uh, so I, I, I do have prepared, I, 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 I have prepared a lot of jokes, but not all of them are very related to uh, various communications. Um, but it's good to be able to laugh at yourselves, right? <laughs> and also, if you have any feedback for me, and if there's any concept you have learned, for example, multiple assets, ionizing radiation, uh, etc., uh, that you feel are uh, unclear to, to you and you need further explanation, uh, you can also uh, let me know and I will reflect on, on those uh, in my next uh, lecture. So yeah, that's all for today. Uh, thank you.